Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you here today. God bless you. Uh, would you take your bulletins in your hands? We have a number of announcements to make today. We actually have a lot of announcements to make today. Uh, first of all, we have an insert uh, to all parents that our heart as a church is to provide a safe and welcoming atmosphere for families who have school-aged children. Uh, so when the children go to Children's Church, please sign your child in and out of Children's Church each Sunday. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet located at the table in the hallway outside of the little learner's room. Uh, please do not stay with your child or children during instruction time. Uh, because this is due to the need for background checks for those who assist the children in our classrooms. Unfortunately, we live in a society that uh, is pretty sick at times and sinful, and churches are sometimes regarded as uh, soft targets for people who want to harm children uh, because there tends to be a very easy, open access to the children which is why we require background checks for everyone who works with our children. So we do ask that of, our, of all the parents. Uh, so we appreciate your help in this area. We really do. Also, too, coming up, another insert uh, for Valentine's Day week, which is coming up very quickly. That week, we are going to cancel Wednesday night service and instead of Wednesday night service, we're going to do a special event Tuesday night and Thursday night on that week. For Tuesday night, it will be a special event for all the couples in the church uh, entitled Reaching for Love. It'll be a dinner theater event meant to encourage every married couple. So if interested, please just show up. Uh, it'll be at 6.30 p.m. Uh, so bring your favorite dish to pass, and there will be prizes and giveaways that night. That's, thir that's Tuesday. And then Thursday night, we have for the singles of the church. Uh, same time, 6.30 p.m. Uh, it'll be entitled Waiting in Love. It'll be a dinner theater event meant to comfort every person waiting on God for a godly spouse. So if interested... Bring your favorite dessert to pass. The main course will be provided, and there will be prizes and giveaways again on that Thursday night. Ah, so we're going to have some fun. Okay? And uh, we'll have that information, too, posted on the events tab of the church's website as well later this week. Uh, also, in your bulletin, now I told you there were going to be a lot of announcements. This is probably going to be the first week where the announcements are longer than my sermon. Uh, today is Mission Sunday. We will be taking up our missions offering for the missionaries we support on a monthly basis. So that's why you have two envelopes in your bulletin, one for your regular tithes and offerings that go to the support of this church in this ministry, and then one where it goes entirely to our missionaries that the church supports. Uh, also, too, if you haven't already, uh, please pick up on the table in the foyer. We have Richard Vermbrand's book, Tortured for Christ. Feel free to pick up a copy. Uh, there are a few left. If you didn't get one last week, uh, help yourself. They're totally free. Uh, they're an incredible testimony of this man. He was a Christian pastor in Romania after World War II, and he wound up spending 14 years in prison for his preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he overcame all that, and uh, he went on to found the Voice of the Martyrs ministry, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So again, you can pick those up also on the table in the foyer are the 2017 annual giving receipts. Thank you for helping to support the ministry and vision of Vineyard Assembly of God, so feel free to stop by and pick up your annual giving receipt. Ladies of Vineyard Assembly of God, please see Lee Griggs. 
with any questions regarding the Love Line ministry for 2018. The pledge forms are due today. There's Sister Lee walking in. Would you like to share a few words about Love Line ministry? I haven't even given you a chance to take your coat off. <laughs> While Sister Lee's coming, I'll share with you that beginning next month in February, next Sunday, February 4th, will be the first offering that we will be taking up for the church's expansion project, which all the pictures and details are on the back wall there. So we're going to be having special envelopes for that. And we're going to be doing that once a month as we need to begin raising funds for not only this expansion, but for all of the little details that go along with it. And so, Sister Lee's here, so. Hey, everyone. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit. I don't know if you know um, about the Love Line, um, but the women's ministry here at the church every year has a, um, a pledge that we make for a mission project through the district. So every year, we make a pledge about this time of year and then in, in November, when we go to the retreat, we get to see how much money was raised to complete that pledge and throughout the whole district. In some years, we've raised like $30,000, you know, for different projects. So um, these love line stands for ladies investing now for eternity, but I, and um, it's something that women can do. We can't always go away on a mission trip but we can help out on these projects. This year, the project is U.S. Missions, and it is um, a con um, combination of Chi Alpha and also Native American ministries and church planting and other, other um, helps for our missionaries. So I hope that you got your pledge form. If not, you can see me. And for the, you know, the cost of a cup of coffee every week, you can be part of this. and help to um, promote this ministry. In the past, we've done um, projects such as Convoy of Hope's feeding program, and also Amira House to help with human trafficking, and House of Hope in Texas for human trafficking, and um, we've even had summer camp for disabled kids and their families. So it's a really worthwhile mission project for us women to be a part of, and men can help out too if they like, but <laughs> thanks so much for your help. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Sister Lee. I also want to share with you to mark your calendar on Sunday, February 11th. Our missionary to Ireland, Patrick O'Laughlin, will be our guest speaker during our morning worship service. And he is a great guy, and I know that you will enjoy his ministry if you've never met him before. And if you are interested, Catherine Netto has provided some material on the table in the foyer regarding the NAMI program. Uh, please see her after service if you have any questions. And I want to share with you one item of news that's really a fantastic testimony. And it regards our project in the future. It regards a lot of things here at the church. Uh, the other week, I met with the Zoning Board of Appeals for Tisbury, and when the church had built the parsonage uh, back in 2007, 2008, uh, the church got a special permit to do that, but there were conditions attached to that special permit. One of those conditions was that no further building was allowed on this property. That order has been rescinded. It's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. So, you know, we're going to be able to, that was the one big hurdle that needed to be removed. So that has been removed. It was an incredible meeting. I didn't have to say almost anything. Uh, I sat down and uh, they had already received the letter I'd sent. And the chairman of the meeting said, this is illegal. We should have never put this condition in there. It was just totally out of our hands, and God just took care of it beautifully. Uh, they did attach a couple conditions. Uh, one of them is that we need to do some additional screen planting uh, along some of our property boundaries for the sake of our abutters. So 
as we begin to receive these building fund offerings, that's what the initial thing is going to be to take care of that screen planting. Uh, but I see it as a good thing in a way because we'll have that screen planting in place when it's time to go ahead and do some of the extension that we need to do with the building. And so it's a way of just, I believe God's setting things up in motion so that we're going to overcome a lot of these hurdles now so that when it's time to do the actual build and the applying for all the permits, we're going to have just free sailing right through uh, to get that done. So God is good. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and would you open your Bibles with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, and we are picking up at verse 15, where we left off last week. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, and I truly believe that this first verse is for many of you today. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And a beautiful lesson there. If we don't yet have something we hope for, we must wait patiently and confidently confidently by faith in God. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence and your promises to us, Lord. Lord God, we thank you that today, now, at this time, we are able to meet and to stand before you by your grace, that we come to you through the blood of Jesus Christ not through a fearful book of laws. Lord in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that what we could not do, you did for us. We could not keep the law of God. None of us could, for your word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yet, Lord Jesus, you kept the law for us, and you have given us your righteousness and taken our sin upon yourself. We thank you for that, Lord God. And Lord, as we pray as your adopted children to you, our Father in heaven, who loves us and cares for us more than we can even comprehend, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are not with us this morning, Lord, who are away from the island or who are sick or who are at home, like our brother Frank Baird, who is struggling with his health. Lord, we just pray your hand to be upon each and every one of them, and may they each sense 
the Holy Spirit with them. Lord, we would be foolish not to spend a moment to thank you for what you did in removing that no-build order from this church, Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you, O oh God, that you are lining things up, that you are setting things up, and that you have this church on the correct path that it needs to be on at this time. Lord, help us to be not weary in well-doing, but know, Lord God, that as we look to you and as we work according to your will, that in due season we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Lord, we give you praise this morning. We praise you, Lord Jesus. All over this church, let's begin to praise the Lord this morning. We praise you, Lord God. We praise you with our voices. We praise you with our hands, O oh God. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you today, Lord God. We invite your presence here, Lord, because your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. So, Lord, we know that you are here. We know that you are here in power, O oh God. And we're believing you that you are going to do a marvelous work in this body today, Lord God. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, let your spirit move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord, church. Amen. I'm going to add one more word to that scripture. Wait with expectation. What are you expecting? Amen. It's okay to wait with expectation. I'm excited to see the move of God in my life. Amen. Aren't you excited? I'm seeing. <laughs> Come on, aren't you excited? Come on now. We serve a great God. Come on. We serve an awesome God. He's doing mighty things in our lives. And I want you to share the mighty things that He is doing in our lives. Amen. Amen. We serve a good God.
forget he's reigning on earth he walks with us he talks with us come on that's who our God is he's a living God he's a living God amen hallelujah
everything we need is in him. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just worship the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hold your hold. 
an incredible spirit of worship here today. And I know some, our normal habit is to end the worship and then we proceed with the rest of the service, with the offering and dismissal of the children. But we forget sometimes that giving of our tithes and our offerings, our missions offerings, whatever, that's an act of worship too. And so this time I'm going to have the ushers come and if you have your missions offering and your tithes and offerings, you can just put them all in together because you've got the separate envelopes. We're going to do that while we keep singing this song. While we keep worshiping the Lord, we're going to give. Hallelujah. So let's keep worshiping the Lord together today.
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Church, I don't think it gets much better than that on this side of heaven, you know? It really was beautiful, beautiful worship today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated if you're not seated already. And I want to take a moment to uh, welcome any first-time visitors. If this is your very first time here, if you could just raise up your hand, uh, we want to welcome you. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Welcome, welcome. Hallelujah. We have some gifts for you, and uh, we want to give you this special gift to welcome you here. Thank you for coming. Praise the Lord. Let's have the children come forward to be dismissed for Children's Church. It's your birthday today. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> Hi. How are you? <laughs> You're five. You're four. I don't have enough fingers or toes to tell you how old I am now. That's what happens, you know. <laughs> What's that? Oh, it was actually yesterday. Well, we count it today, right? Praise the Lord. You guys are awesome. You know that? You are great kids. Who wants to pray today? Is anybody? You want to pray today? Okay, you can go right ahead. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful world on this world you've given us salvation. Amen. Amen. You can go right on down to your classes now. God bless you. How you doing? How are you? What's your name? Nice to meet you, Nathan. Good to see you. You can go right on to your class. Follow the others. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, we've been preaching the past few weeks on from generation to generation how to change your family by letting God change you. And we've been looking at just a few generations within the family line of Jesus leading up to King David. We talked about Rahab, then we talked about Naomi. And we talked about Boaz, and then we're talking today about, finally, Ruth. I bet you were wondering when I was going to get to Ruth. Uh, we're, I mean, we're in the book of Ruth. When is he going to talk about Ruth? Today's the day. Would you turn with me to the book of Ruth, chapter 1? And we're going to look at verses 16 through 18 today. We'll read the scripture and then we will ask God's blessing to be upon the message. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. The Bible says, But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. 
Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we look to you, Lord Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. Father, I need the Holy Spirit to be able to preach your word the way you want it preached to your people. And Father, your people need the Holy Spirit to be able to hear from your word the very message and the very things that you want to convey to each and every man and woman in this room today. So Lord Jesus, we are trusting you now for the work of the Holy Spirit to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. I'm preaching today about Ruth from loving to loved. See, when we talked about all of these different people, Rahab from ruined to redeemed, Naomi from bitter to blessed, Boaz from faithful to fruitful, in every one of these people there was a transformation that occurred. A change occurred within them. God worked a change in them and then that change that had been worked affected their family destiny and their family chemistry around them. And for Ruth, the change is she goes from loving to being loved. It's an incredible transformation that occurs for this woman named Ruth. The Bible says that God is love. How many of you have heard that before? I think virtually all of us have heard that. And since we were created in the image and likeness of God, this means that we were also created with the capacity to both give and to receive love. We need love. And love can exist on many different levels. There's, of course, the love of a parent for a child. Uh, there's the love of a child for their parents. There is the love of a husband for his wife, the love of a wife for her husband. There's the love of a friend for another friend. There's the love of a Christian to another Christian. There's the love of one human being to a fellow human being. And I'm sure there are many other permutations that we can go on of looking at how love occurs within our relationships. But according to the Bible, the highest form of love that there is, the highest form of love that exists in the universe is agape love. Agape is a Greek word that really does not translate well into, into English. We just use the word love, you know, and, and we use the word love for as it's been said, our nearest and dearest and a candy bar, you know? I love Snickers bars, I love my wife. We understand that we're meaning something different, but we use the same word. With Greek, it was different. You used a different word to convey the different meaning. Agape love is love without any conditions attached. There are no strings attached, no conditions. It's a total gift of love. It's not about, you know, I'll love you if you love me. Or I'll love you if you love me first. Or I'll love you hoping that you do this for me. That's not agape love. Agape love is simply just, I love you, period. Whether you respond to that or not, whether you do anything with that or not, I love you and I still love you. That's agape love. And that's the kind of love that God has for us and that's the kind of love we're called to have for one another. But difficulties arise within us as human beings because we are human. 
We are flawed, we are imperfect, we've been damaged and contaminated by the effects of sin and the curse. So difficulties arise when we give love, but we don't experience or feel love in return. And sometimes we can, love is being given to us, but we just don't perceive that love. You know, it was, it was like that for me as a child growing up. My parents loved me. Absolutely, they loved me. But my parents were, just the way they were raised, they really didn't say the words, I love you. You know, they showed it in acts of service. They showed it in gift giving. They showed it in making sure your needs were met. They showed it in providing a home. But what was I looking for? I was, as a child, I was looking for on the inside, I wanted to hear those words, I love you. Because as a child, I just couldn't comprehend that when my parents were going off and working and providing food and clothing and shelter and this and that, that they were loving me. But I wanted to hear those words. So I grew up not really feeling that I was loved. It was always a question in the back of my mind. Dr. Melissa Valles, writing in March 4th, 2015, for his psychiatry advisor says, depression and anxiety disorders are the most common mental health disorders in the United States. And social isolation is clearly linked to higher rates of depression and anxiety. Social isolation is a technical phrase for not feeling loved. So even psychiatrists realize that when you're not feeling loved or you're not experiencing love, you tend to have higher rates of depression and anxiety. You see, when a person is unloved or feels unloved, that person begins to perceive themselves as unlovely and then eventually as unlovable. No one's loving me, no one's loving me, so I must be an unlovely person. And since I am an unlovely person, I must be unlovable. Something's gotta be wrong with me. I'm a malfunction, I'm a reject, I'm a screw up, I'm a disaster, I'm a mistake. There's no purpose now for my life. There's no reason for my continued existence on this world. And out of that perception of unlovely and unlovable come two powerful emotional convictions. Resentment or despair. And both make it difficult for people to receive the good news of the kingdom of God. When people don't feel or experience love, when they grow up feeling unlovely or, and unlovable, it either creates strong resentment in them, anger against people, against society, or it creates a strong despair in them where they see no purpose for their continued living on this world. I think this is why we see in our society today so many terrible things happening, like what happened out in Nevada a few months ago where the man took all those rifles up into that hotel and just started shooting everybody down at that concert and then died himself. This is why you're seeing so many of these events happening where people just, for whatever reason, they just start killing people randomly and then they kill themselves or let themselves be killed by the police because they've got that resentment and despair mixed in together within them. These things make it so hard for people to really grab a hold of and comprehend the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which if we can put it all in one phrase, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That scripture just came up on the screens. Let's change it a little bit. For God so loved, instead of the world, look at one another and say you. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now look at that scripture again and read it differently. For God so loved me. Go ahead and say that to yourself. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Somebody said hallelujah and you're absolutely right. God so loved me. But when you're convinced that you're unlovable and unlovely, it's really hard to get that in. You may accept it intellectually, but it's hard to get it in the heart. Now, this message is about Ruth's journey, what God did for her, and it's meant today to be a message of hope and healing to all of you who know, deep down inside, you know you have a great capacity to love. But you, in some area, in some relationship of life, do not feel loved. (coughs) If I could get a drink of water, honey, please. Thank you. Let's look at Ruth chapter 1, verses 11 through 14 now. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Thank you. I want to share with you from that this thought that Ruth was loving toward a person unable to love her. See, what we just read is about Naomi. What had happened was Naomi had started back towards Bethlehem in Israel where she was from. Her two daughters-in-law who were recently widowed came with her for a time. And then Naomi turns around and gives them this long speech telling them, just go home. There's no hope for your life with me. I'm too old to get married again. I've got no more sons for you to go ahead and marry. That's it. I'm done. And Orpah, one daughter-in-law, goes back. But Ruth stays. Ruth decides to love someone who was unable to love her. Ruth, the Bible says, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. (coughs) If I could have that again, honey. I apologize, I sang too much in worship today. (laughs) Ruth is clinging to Naomi, but Naomi is so bitter that all she can think about is herself and her own pain. Her husband had died, and now both her sons had died. Naomi actually goes so far as to say, it's more bitter for me than it's for you. Think about this. She's talking to her daughter-in-law, her daughter-in-law whose husband had just died. And Naomi's saying, it's worse for me than it is for you. Naomi just is so collapsed within herself with her own pain and with her own bitterness, she cannot comprehend that Ruth is also in pain, that Ruth just suffered loss. So Naomi, at this time, she 
cannot love Ruth. She cannot show love because Naomi has collapsed within herself. All she can do is take in and take in and take in. She can't give out. But Ruth makes a different choice. Ruth chose not to become embittered like Naomi became embittered. And Ruth, even though she's suffering pain because her husband had just died, Ruth decides to go through that pain and love Naomi because she realizes that Naomi needs that love. C.S. Lewis writes in his work called A Grief Observed, which he wrote about the grieving process that he went through when his wife, Joy, died of cancer. He writes, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting. Yet I want others to be around me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not to me. What an incredible statement about the effects of grief and about collapsing within oneself because of grief. He's saying, I want people to be around me. I hate being alone, but I just wish they'd talk to each other and not me. I want people around me, but I want to be left alone. This is exactly how Naomi was at this time. So the question is, How do we love someone who is unable to show you love in return? How do you do that? How do you love someone who has been so broken and embittered by life that all they can think about is their own pain and their own agony? The answer to that question is learn to love them in the areas where they have the greatest need. Galatians 5.14 says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. See, Naomi makes four statements that reveal what's going on in her heart. She says, why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? I am too old to have another husband, and the Lord's hand has turned against me. What is she saying when she says those things? Because very often people say something, but there's a message underneath those words. So what's Naomi's message? She's saying, I have no value, I have no future, I have no hope, I have no help. That's what she's saying. Why would you come with me? I have no value. Am I going to have any more sons? I have no future. I am too old to have another husband. I have no hope. The Lord's hand has turned against me. I have no help. See, in her pain and in her bitterness against God, Naomi does exactly what so many hurting people do, especially Christians, which is isolate themselves by either passively or aggressively pushing people away. This is what Naomi's doing to Ruth. Why do you want to come with me? I have no value, I have no future, I have no hope, I have no help, just leave me alone and go home. But Ruth decides to stay, to love this woman who had now in her own mind no value, no future, no hope, and no help at all. Josh Busey writing 
April 19th, 2016, and Delivered by Grace says, how many times have you watched people become isolated due to relationship problems, job responsibilities, or other factors that create a distance between an individual and their church? In many cases, that specific case doesn't end well. The person ends up drifting away or joins another church looking for a close bond with another group of Christians. However, if it's a broken relationship that created the isolation, that same pattern will likely follow that person from church to church. Satan is good at what he does and he places much more of his emphasis upon creating division and isolation. When the wolves chase the sheep, who do the wolves go after? The stragglers, the strays, the isolated ones. And so Ruth says to Naomi, I am not going to let you isolate yourself. I know you're hurting. I know you're grieving. I know you're in pain. I know you're bitter, but I'm not going to not love you despite that. It's a beautiful statement of ministry that's happening. So how did Ruth actually demonstrate that love to Naomi? It says that Ruth clung to her. Naomi's trying to push her away, go back home. I've got no value, no future, no hope. God's against me, I've got no help. But Ruth hangs on to her and won't let her go. Ruth, by doing that, by hanging on, was communicating to Naomi, Naomi, I don't care what you say. I say you have value. I say you have future. I say you have hope. I say that I will help. I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm with you through this journey. And Ruth gave to Naomi the same love that we would want when we face a crisis of life, an unshakable, unalterable, unchangeable, unconditional love with no strings attached. And this is the love that God loved us with even when we were unable to love him back. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. See, it's God's love that teaches us how to love one another. God showed us agape so that we can understand what agape love really is. Especially when that other person considers themselves unlovely and unlovable in whatever way. So Ruth loved Naomi. Ruth hung on to her and clung to her and stayed with her and they went back to Bethlehem and Naomi was too old to work so Ruth goes out into the fields to pick up the leftovers, to glean and to get food for Naomi and for herself. And so some time goes by and then we see something happen right at the beginning of Ruth chapter three. So if you turn to Ruth chapter three, verse one, you're gonna see something surprising occur. It says, one day, I love that, just one day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Imagine what a shock that must have been. Just one day, we'll pick a day, Tuesday morning. They wake up and they're 
get their meager breakfast together. Another day of the same old, same old. And out of the blue, Naomi announces to Ruth, my daughter, I have to do something for you. I gotta find a home for you where you're gonna be well provided for. What's happening here? All of a sudden, Ruth was being loved by someone she did not expect to be loved by. Ruth loved Naomi with agape love. There were no conditions, no strings attached. And so Ruth was never expecting Naomi to love her back because she's figuring, my mother-in-law, she's just shot. Life has hit her like a truck and she is so broken, I'm just gonna have to take care of her till I bury her. But all of a sudden, one day, Naomi announces, Ruth, I love you. I'm thinking about your needs, about your value, about your future, about your hope, and I want to help you. It's a surprise. Naomi isn't being bitter about life. Naomi isn't thinking about her grief. Naomi's thinking totally about Ruth. What does Jesus say about this? He says in Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know, in the church, we preach those verses so wrong because we break them up into pieces and take them totally out of context. We just say sometimes, you know, your your kids are fighting with each other You know, daddy, he did this. Daddy, she did this. And what do we say? Don't judge or you'll be judged. You know, don't condemn or you'll be condemned. Well, make sure you forgive or you're not going to be forgiven. And then the big time, you know, the big one is, you know, whenever there's a big offering to be taken up, give and it shall be given to you. But it's not talking about money. It's not talking about these in isolated things. It's talking about how to love someone who is unlovable. You see, our tendency is that when somebody's unlovable, when somebody's hurting, they tend to hurt other people. When somebody's feeling like a jerk on the inside, they tend to treat other people like jerks on the outside. And so what do we tend to do? Well, we're going to condemn them. Stay away from that person. They're a troublemaker. Ah, they got problems. Let's walk away from them. You know, they've got some serious sin issues. We need to pray for that poor brother. Well, they hurt me. They come to church every Sunday and I see them worshiping and they hurt me. What will happen to forgiveness? Or to give. Give, give, because God promises that when we give, when we give love, when we give ministry to others in love, especially those who can't love us back, God is promising it's going to come back to you. Somehow, some way, sooner or later, probably from someone you did not even expect to ever be loved by, God is going to pour that love back into you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. You know, when we look at that verse, we look at that one wrong too. We we look at that verse and we see the word needs. (gasps) Just my needs. All I need is one tube of toothpaste. Not the big tube, but the small tube. You know, I don't need a steak dinner. 
All I need is a piece of bologna and a potato. That's all I need. That's what we think. We think God is in the business of rationing. That God is like a heavenly Ebenezer Scrooge and he's just going to give out what you absolutely barely need. During World War II, because of the activity of German submarines and aircraft, food had to be rationed in Great Britain because Great Britain's got the same problem we have on Martha's Vineyard. It's an island. And everything had to come in by ship. Well, it had problems because the Germans were sinking all the ships coming into England. So they had to ration their food. Now here is a typical weekly ration for one person in England during World War II. One egg, half a stick of butter, two tea bags, one slice of cheese, four slices of bacon, one stick of margarine, one cup of sugar. Bread was not rationed. Meat was rationed by price. They just made meat really expensive so you couldn't afford to buy it anyway. And vegetables were never rationed because you were encouraged to grow vegetables on every plot of ground that could grow something. But can you imagine living one person on one egg? I mean, there are five people in my family. That means every week we'd get five eggs. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get in the mood for an omelet and I can eat three or four eggs in one sitting. When you hear the word needs, don't think of rationing, think blessing, because God who knows everything will bless you where and when and how you need to be blessed. God says, I'm gonna meet your needs. Here's your need, I am going to bless that need. Get an idea, picture a bucket being dumped on you. You need love, here you go. You need this, I'm going to take care of you here. And this is why when Naomi demonstrates love to Ruth, she doesn't send her a thank you note with a bouquet of flowers. She loves Ruth at Ruth's point of need. My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. She doesn't say, my daughter, let's go down to the Hallmark store so I can pick out a card for you that says how appreciative I am of all that you've done. Well, that would have been nice, but that's not what Ruth needed. Ruth needed a future too. And Naomi says, I'm gonna get that for you. You see, Naomi is communicating to Ruth. Now, Ruth, you have value. You have future. You have hope and I'm going to be the one to help you now. Learning to love people where they need to be loved is sometimes a challenge. It's kind of like the post-it note I wrote this morning. You're looking at me like, okay, where is he going with this one? Well, this morning I got up first and I was making a few things and I walked back in our bedroom and Liz says to me, she says, honey, there are four chocolate chip muffins left. Sean is supposed to get two and I want the other two. (laughs) Which means I don't get any and Madeline and Nathan aren't supposed to have any because we already had our ration yesterday. (laughs) So I was making banana bread this morning anyway and uh, so that's all right. So I said, you know what? We got the muffins in this jar in the kitchen, and it's a glass jar so the kids can see in it, which isn't always a good idea. So I got out a Post-it note, and I got a black Sharpie marker, and I wrote on it, two for Sean, two for Mom. And I go to stick the Post-it note on the cookie jar, and it won't stick because I wrote it on the wrong side of the post-it note. (laughs) Now I'm sharing with you that story because 
When I wrote that on the post-it note, everything looked right. But it wasn't right because it wouldn't stick. It kept sliding off. See, when we don't know how to love someone the way they need to be loved, and we're loving them the way we think they should be loved, it all looks right to us, but it won't stick. We gotta stick it on there because we have to do it the right way, the way that they need to be loved. So what did Naomi do for Ruth? Well, she arranged a few things. And in Ruth 4, 13 through 15, it says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than, to you than seven sons has given him birth. Here's Ruth, a young, childless, foreigner, who has dedicated herself to taking care of her mother-in-law, she ends up, because of her mother-in-law's love, being loved by a husband, having a loving family, and being loved by an entire community. The one who is loving winds up being so loved. Amen. So brothers and sisters, if you feel unloved or unlovely or unlovable today, especially within the circle of your own family or even within your own marriage, I want you to know that God has incredible love for you. And he will often manifest that through his church. And so if you're in pain, if you're in grief, don't isolate yourself in it but let others love you through your pain and your grief. And for those of you who are in a place who are able to give love to others, give it sensitively and practically to others. Just as Jesus Christ has loved you, let Jesus Christ love others through you. Let's stand together, church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We've had an incredible, incredible worship service today. I think a lot of it was the Holy Spirit was just embracing all of us and showing us that he is here to love you. Paris and Allie are gonna come and lead us in worship. But I want to open these altars up for you. I know the altars were open earlier in this service. And people came to pray for a need. But if you're someone in this church, and it's gonna, I know it's gonna take courage and humility to do what I'm gonna ask you to do right now. But if you're someone who does not feel loved, who feels unlovely or unlovable, and hello, guys can feel that way too, okay? But I'd like you to just come up to the altar and we're gonna and just be here to let others in this church gather around you and pray for you and pray with you, talk with you and let God show his love to you this way. And who knows, as you talk to your brothers and sisters who will be up here, Maybe you're going to find out that God is calling you to love them practically in a way that's more than just, 
I love you with the love of the Lord. Pat you on the head. Bye-bye. See you next week. But these altars are open right now. If you feel unloved or unlovely in any way, would you come? And we're going to let others gather around you and pray. You can go ahead and lead us.
it's always our prayer that everyone in this church feels loved when they walk in these doors. Loved by God, loved by us, and loved by one another. That's our prayer. So I just want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to go out of your way to demonstrate love to those you see coming in these doors, to those you encounter in work or in stores or wherever you are, both on this island and off this island. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine through you. Because you know what? You may be the only light a person sees. Truly, truly, be ashamed if you need somebody to hold your hand or just say whisper a word of God loves you in your ear it's okay we've all been through it amen God glory to God God is good Sister Emily Thomas, would you come and close the service in a word of prayer, please? We thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, we just bless your name, God. We are coming down off and high of praise and worship to you, Lord. And God, I'm touched in a special way today, Lord, and I thank you for that. As we leave here this morning, God, we just pray that your presence will continue with us. Heavenly Father, for those of us, Lord, who are feeling a little left out, a little unloved, a little unlovable, Heavenly Father, we're just asking you this morning that you will just rain down on them your love, Lord. Heavenly Father, in your way, let them know how much you love them, God. Heavenly Father, we know that you are love. Your word says that. You're a God of love, and you are love. And that's why we come. Heavenly Father, we just pray this morning that for those of us here who are members or partners of this church, that we will open up our hearts to show our visitors love. Those of us who are not members, Heavenly Father, may we engulf them in the love that you have so blessed us with. Heavenly Father, may we let them feel special today and every day that this is their church home, that they need not be ashamed or be afraid to come to us, Lord. So, Heavenly Father, today we just ask that you go with us as we leave. And may this love also transcend, God, out through these doors into all the places that we touch today and this week, our jobs, our homes, the places that we go to visit, the supermarket, the ferry. Heavenly Father, may your love radiate through us. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.